I've been involved in medicine for well over 30 years now. I actually started out as a volunteer EMT in an ambulance service in my hometown when I was fairly young. Um, actually liked it, thought uh, it was something that I wanted to do full time and then took a job as a uh, EMT and later uh, went to paramedic training and worked as a paramedic for several years in multiple aspects from um, being a paramedic in the streets to managing an ambulance service to uh, developing and uh, coordinating a paramedic training program to starting a helicopter uh, flight service and uh, went on from that to medical school and emergency medicine training and, and now I'm currently a medical director of uh, emergency trauma center. Uh, in Minot. So you're from uh, North Dakota. I'm from North Dakota. And, and so you've been building a regionalized system of care there. We in our area have worked, uh, North Dakota is, is fairly regionalized into four quadrants and it's healthcare. And I work in the northwest uh, quadrant of North Dakota, which is one of the more rural areas. We have a huge geographic area that we're the ter tertiary center for, spanning about 300 miles east to west from central North Dakota into Montana and from the Canadian border down halfway through North Dakota, so 150 miles or so north to south. It's a huge area with very rural and frontier counties uh, with huge industry, with a huge oil boom going on currently. And for the last 10 years, we've really worked on streamlining our STEMI care in our hospital. We're a PCI hospital. And we um, have an ALS ambulance service. We started doing 12 leads in the field 10 years ago. And that worked well. We streamlined our in-town process to bypass the ER to get those patients to the cath lab. We we're showing tremendous benefit to our patients. And out of a couple success stories really came the thought of how could we push this out into our region? And four years ago, we started transmitting EKGs, which kind of opened up the door to basic level EMTs. Uh, doing 12 leads in the field. So I had some early adopters and basic services that were willing to jump on and buy the equipment and we started doing 12 leads in the field and it was very evident very early that these are people that are very capable, that they can do the 12 leads, uh, they can transmit it, we can identify the STEMI patients, we can streamline that care and that patient can roll to our hospital. As an ER doctor, my role in taking care of a STEMI patient from the field should be to read an EKG, call a cath lab, tell a cardiologist, and then point as the patient comes through and they roll through our doors to the cath lab table. And those door to balloon times are very low when that happens. So how far is too far for primary PCI? And at what point um, is, is thrombolytics maybe followed by PCI a more correct? We, we in our region uh, uh, have looked at our region closely. And there are challenges in a rural area uh, beyond just how far is too far because the distance, when you measure it in time, changes greatly depending on multiple factors. Those factors might be weather, uh, we might have roads closed from snow, uh, those distances might be because the aircraft, the helicopter can fly one day and they can't because of freezing rain on another, or it might be out on another call. So we look at, um, uh, kind of time and distance. And in our region, all of the critical access hospitals surrounding our center are kind of beyond that primary region. Uh, where we focus on direct uh, to the cath lab would be ambulance services that are picking up that may be backtracking to a critical access hospital that could come our way. Um, the other thing that we look at, I actually have one paid paramedic service that we're doing thrombolytics in the field. It is out in the middle of nowhere. They are about 90 minutes by ground to our hospital. They have a hospital that's closer, but it is a critical access hospital with limited capabilities. It's about 40 minutes away. So we're, we're looking at a paid service that, um, and the thought process is if they can, can't be to a PCI hospital in 60 minutes, and they can't be to a critical access hospital in 30 minutes, and they're an advanced service, we should be doing thrombolytics in the field. So we're doing that. We've been doing it now going on 12 years. Uh, with that said, we've had some success. Uh, we don't have a lot of data because that's a service in a rural area that's doing very few calls. Even as a paid service, they're only doing about eight or 900 calls a year, meaning they have maybe one or two STEMIs a year. So over that 10 year period, they've carried thrombolytics. Uh, only a handful of times uh, have we given thrombolytics in the field. 
Uh, so we TNK don't have, or? We, we're, they're carrying TNK, yes. And we're doing that with online orders. We have very strict protocol. Uh, the STEMI is identified by the paramedic in the house. Uh, the protocol, they go right into getting a hold of medical control online. Part of that protocol is calling for the helicopter immediately. They stay in the house, they go through the checklist, they start their IVs, they're on the line with the physician, the physician's looking at the EKG with them, and uh, if the patient meets criteria, they're starting the TNK in the house, and the helicopter shows up at the scene and then transports the patient. Uh, should there be bad weather, our plan B then is to transport that patient once the drug is given by ground. And uh, knock on wood, we've not had any no transport days, which we sometimes get, where uh, it's impossible to get out of even that area for the ambulance service to go because of blizzard conditions. And uh, we end up holding those patients uh, in the local clinic with the paramedics and uh, the local uh, nurse practitioner uh, watching them for the night. But it's not happened with a STEMI patient yet. Recent study was published showing that the door to balloon times at PCI hospitals around the country have really dramatically shortened. The old standard was 120 minutes and then the goal was 90 minutes and now top performing hospitals are routinely under 90 minutes, probably closer to 60 minutes. But there's also studies coming out that, that show when a STEMI patient self-reports to a non-PCI hospital that their door in to door out times um, are, are well in excess often of, of 30 minutes. Have you found that patients that self-report to uh, hospitals that do not offer primary PCI, that there are delays in treatment or transfer, and how has North Dakota solved this problem, or how is it addressing this problem? It, it is a problem for walk-in patients or self-presenting patients to get the same attention that an ambulance patient gets. And the reason is, if you're a small facility um, and someone shows up at the door, um, sometimes to get things moving when you're calling people from home, you're calling staff in from home to do, do things at night, it takes time to do that. And the way you address that and the way we're addressing it is we communicate. We put all the players together and you don't have to be in the same room. We do it through, through uh, electronic means now where we're using a system, video conferencing, and we have a network of our critical access hospitals along with the tertiary center. And we talk about things like protocols and measurement of times. Um, I think the key is if you don't measure it, you're not going to know where you're at and you're not going to be able to improve. So things like American Heart, with Get With yeah, the Guideline absolutely. is very important because we start measuring those key elements. And then when we find out that we're not quite as fast as we thought we were in getting those EKGs, we can then, if we're communicating with our peers, meaning the other hospitals in the region, we can say, Hospital A, how did you do this? How did you cut your times? Your times went down, ours stayed the same or got worse. And you start learning little tricks that little hospitals with similar situations that you have are doing it. Or you can talk to your larger facility that you're sending patients to about help us with protocols to how to streamline this. Um, we see um, hospitals that are really looking at this and focusing on process. Process improvement is what it is. It's not that those people don't know how to take care of STEMI patients. Exactly. If you've not practiced and now you've been working for a year and because you're low volume, your first STEMI patient comes in, even though you know what to do, you don't have those steps you're, in place. Yeah, you're not, you're not well rehearsed. So we, we rehearse it, we talk about it, we plan for this is the primary way we do it. We talk about transfer out early, getting the, the helicopter coming, getting uh, the transfer crew coming while you're doing these things. Go away from the serial processing where you do this, you do this, and you do this, where you do everything at the same time. And all of a sudden you're saving time and taking care of those patients. So how do you convince a critical access hospital that maybe isn't certified through JCO or isn't really collecting this much data on STEMI patients and uh, maybe they're not well staffed or, or, or it, would, it, would rec it would create an extra work burden for them or maybe for whatever reason they just don't want to report the data. How do you, what's the incentive or how do you get them to start reporting so that we can have a statewide tracking system in, in any state? I, I think there's multiple ways you can address it. Um, one of the ways that seems to have worked in our region for multiple things is to come up with statewide systems uh, here in South Dakota, they uh, got a wonderful grant and are working on their STEMI project. Um, 
something like that is going to tie people together. We have a similar project statewide in North Dakota that we've started now. And so by having a statewide initiative, you start getting people on board. Um, when you think back to other systems that are in place, our trauma system in our state in North Dakota is more than 20 years mature. It's a system that works very well, but there's stumbling blocks along the way, and it takes time to get everybody on board. But when you start showing success stories, and people start talking at conferences how well things are working for them, you've got early adapters, you've got late adapters, and you've got all the people in the middle. When the late adapters are starting to see, well, everybody else is doing it, and they hear about, this is how we do it, and this is how great it works, all of a sudden, they're willing to get on board. When you start talking about the quality, a lot of people are afraid of quality initiatives because they don't want to look bad. But when we start looking at it and become transparent about it, we all have the same issues. And if we talk about it, we'll solve the problem together much quicker as a group than we would have if we worked on it individually. So I think communication is the key, is having a common goal in mind and doing what's best for the patient every single time. And if we do that, uh, things start to smooth out. We start to tear down political barriers, and we start working together, and we start to see a system unfold that 10, 20 years in the future will look back on and say, wow, th this is so great what we've done. And in, in my 30 years in medicine, I'm happy to be able to look back and think that there's some things that I was involved in that have turned out pretty darn cool. Well, you can be justifiably proud. And uh, so thanks for sharing the story with us and letting us know about what's happening in North Dakota. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure.